sometimes, evil can be found in the most innocent of places. This Berlin parking lot seems like nothing out of the ordinary. Children play here, people walk their dogs. But in May of 1945, this spot was literally hell on earth. Adolf Hitler's Berlin bunker has come to symbolize the end of a nightmarish historical era. For within the dank walls of his bunker, he and his Third Reich came to a suicidal end. During those last days in the bunker, there is no doubt that Hitler was deranged. The world wanted Hitler's bunker obliterated, and many thought that it was. But amazingly, much of it may still exist. What we can bring forth by doing this study together is an accurate depiction of these bunkers. We go in search of one of the most notorious places in all of human history and rebuild Hitler's lost bunker on unsolved history. Modern day Berlin. This huge city survived a traumatic century. For the world war that began here ended with the Soviet Union destroying and then occupying half of the city building a wall that stood to keep the world away. Today, that wall and much of that past have been demolished. But like the unexploded bombs that still lie underneath Berlin, there is a secret history that can detonate without warning. For example, in 1990, this site was exposed. Used by the SS Motor Corps, it was known as the Farer, or Driver's Bunker. On the walls, grim pictures from the time remain. also filled with artifacts, each one with a story behind it. Here, we have the coveted dagger that never left the side of a loyal Hitler youth. Here, remnants of the Enigma machine, state-of-the-art 1945 technology used to code and decode secret messages sent by the German high command. And here, one of the gas tanks used to cremate the bodies of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun after their mutual suicide. Deaths that took place within the claustrophobic confines of Hitler's bunker. Although this underground lair of Adolf Hitler has captured the imagination of the world, strangely, very little is really known about it. Its location is unmarked, its true dimensions unknown. But within its walls, history was made, and a nightmare ended. The bunker has captured the public imagination, mainly because it was the final death rattle, grotesque death rattle of the Third Reich. Berlin, April 1945. After four years of brutal fighting, the Red Army draws near. The desperate defenders forced them to fight for the city, street by street, house by house. There was no such thing as a civilian in Berlin. Many of them were so desperate to get food ready for the siege that they would still stand in line in the street, uh, either queuing for bread or even for water, because by that stage the water supplies had broken down, as well as electricity. And many women were slaughtered or literally blown to pieces uh, in the open. And it's often said that the queues then sort of closed up again with people just with blood on their ration cards and making sure they just didn't lose their place in the queue. Few people who witnessed Hitler's final moments are alive today. The brutal fighting and the passage of time saw to that. 
But unsolved history did uncover two men who once walked the corridors of Hitler's lost bunker. Armin Lehmann was a young runner for the Hitler Youth. Given bicycles with bazookas strapped to them, they were ordered to take on huge Russian tanks. As a runner, Armin was in the bunkers of the Reich's Chancellery and also in the Fuhrer bunker, which lay next door. He was one of the last people to see Hitler alive. The last days I had no conception whatsoever um, what time it was. Sometimes I even lost the sense of it was day or night because uh, there was so much smoke out there. Rockus Misch was a sergeant in Hitler's SS bodyguard detachment. He was also Hitler's telephone operator in the bunker. There were civilians as well who had our telephone number, friends and acquaintances. They called us and were asking for help. Goebbels had to reassure them, and I did too, that they should hold out. Yes, they said, but people are being raped here. On April 20th, 1945, the day of his 56th birthday, Adolf Hitler descended into his bunker. He would never come out again. Even he knew that the end was near. When the first artillery shells um, landed uh, close to the bunker, Hitler came out unshaven from his room um, and uh, yelling, I mean, um, appalled and sort of gesticulating, saying, what's happening? And Hitler was shaken um, to realize that the Russians really were at the gates of Berlin. As those gates were smashed open, Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propagandist, joined his Führer. He brought along his wife, and six children. At first, the bunker's 13-foot thick walls protected Hitler in his inner circle. Huge ventilators circulated the air 36 feet below the ground. There was enough food, water, and champagne to last a month. Isolated within its 40 rooms, they prayed for a miracle, but knew that time was running out. We heard it if a shell or heavy bomb hit the exit tower. That was concrete. You could hear that. But otherwise, we heard nothing, nothing at all. Down there, it was completely quiet, humming of ventilation, nothing more. The minute you left the bunker, especially during the last days, it was like a steel hail. The one officer who was there described it as a mixture of hysteria and resignation. People were drinking very heavily indeed. Many of them, in a sort of fairly drunken way, were discussing the best way to commit suicide. Was it with a pistol or was it with a cyanide capsule? Adolf Hitler took no chances. On April 30th, 1945, he used both pistol and cyanide. Before the Russians arrived, Hitler and Eva Braun were thoroughly cremated. Only a few fragments of their bones survived. Joseph Goebbels and his wife shared their Fuhrer's fate. But before taking their lives, they murdered their six children. They, in fact, had been drugged first. And uh, then, while drugged, uh, Magda Goebbels and uh, a doctor, an SS doctor, had forced open their jaws and um, put, put cyanide capsules in their mouths. The bodies of Goebbels and his wife survived the flames, providing a grisly postscript to the already nightmarish end of the Third Reich. July, 1945. In this rarely seen film, an American army photographer takes a tour of a now devastated Berlin. What the bombs and the street fighting didn't obliterate, the Russians destroyed after the war ended. In 1947, two years after they took Berlin, they blew up the remains of Hitler's bunker and raised the Reich Chancellery that lay next door. So it was just covered over uh, and nothing more was said about it. And everybody in the, in the West had assumed that they had blown it up completely. And in 1988, 
One year before the wall fell, a second East German program of demolition took place, further obliterating any traces. Where is Hitler's bunker today? Although no signs exist to point the way, its original location is no secret. Hitler's bunker lies underneath this parking lot. But what do we really know about this infamous structure? What, if anything, remains? Is it important that we find out? The secrecy of the bunker, especially the way that it was maintained, first of all, by the Nazis as secret, and then by the Soviet authorities uh, as a secret area and cordoned off, has obviously uh, greatly contributed to the myth of the bunker and its uh, image of a secret, uh, a secret end and a secret place. I think that the ground in Berlin, uh, generally spoken, is poisoned. Sibylla Quack is the executive director to the Foundation to the Murdered Jews of Europe. She believes that the bunker must be preserved, but not as a shrine. I don't think they should be preserved as a museum. And I think it's very important that we educate people and that we tell them how it happened and who did it and where it was done. But we did not want this special place as a place to commemorate Hitler. Although there are many pieces of the bunker's history scattered in archives and museums throughout Germany and Russia, nobody is certain about what remains on the original site. In order to put these missing pieces of history together before it's too late, Unsolved History assembled a crack investigative team. What we can bring forth, I think, by doing this study together is an accurate depiction of these bunkers and what the Fuhrer bunker was like in uh, 1945 as the war drew to an end. Dietmar Arnold, historian and Berlin's leading bunker expert. Is... Professor Alfred Kandel, former chief of archaeology for the city of Berlin. I was responsible for magnetic measurements. Gerd were... Plowman, a geophysicist specializing in ground sonar mapping. Nikolai Luko, a computer graphics designer who can turn our data into three dimensional images. And Rockus Misch, Hitler's bodyguard and phone operator. Haunted by the past. He will help verify the accuracy of our reconstruction. By combining their respective disciplines and bringing the science of the 21st century back to war-ravaged Berlin, Hitler's bunker, one of the world's most toxic and significant structures, will be rebuilt. And these missing pieces of history will be put back together. Our investigation begins with some myths that must be exploded. There were actually two Berlin bunkers used by Hitler during the war. The Four Bunker, or Upper Bunker, was built in 1935 and held the kitchens, staff quarters, and at the end of the war was the home of the Goebbels family. Hitler's inner sanctum, the Lower, or Fuhrer Bunker, was built in 1943. These upper and lower sections were connected by a rectangular stairwell, and entry was strictly controlled. This is where Hitler's private rooms and personal headquarters were located, and where he committed suicide in 1945. Although this Fuhrer bunker has been obliterated, other bunkers remain. Through this subway entrance, we find the Gesundbrunnen bunker, one of the more perfectly preserved of these wartime relics. This civilian air raid shelter was a multi-story complex that honeycombed under the Berlin streets. By visiting, we can get an idea of what it was like to be trapped underground. Now we stay here in the second level. These are the stairs going down the, the subway. Yes, that's right. And this is where the track is? Yes, here you can see the, metro, uh, the subway channel here. These bunkers were cold and damp. You know, I found it very cool, and I always shivered. And apparently, uh, 
Hitler preferred cooler temperatures. Here is where civilians would try and sleep through the night bombing raids. Hitler's bunker had flush toilets that worked surprisingly well. The only uh, part of all the complex that was clean and smelled clean and the toilets were working was the upper and the lower bunker. I don't even know who cleaned them. There was no cleaning woman or anything ever inside. It must have been Hitler's valet. Here, as in Hitler's bunker, were ventilation systems to cycle the air. Normally this works with electric motors, uh -huh. but if it's the electric power works not here inside. It you goes can, out. It's go out, you can do a move all by hand. Although the Fuhrer bunker had this manual capability, there were backup generators to ensure continuous power. These generators always ran. Nobody living below could escape the sound. I'm sure the walls were soundproof, except for the noise from the ventilators, and it was like a humming sound. I don't know what to compare it with. It was not a normal sound. It was a penetrating sound. As the bunker was a sealed system, the air pressure needed to be maintained. There was one last safety precaution. What would happen if the lights went out? Well, we can show you. We can make the light out, if it's possible. Uh, it's illuminated color, and if I go here with a uh, flashlight over, you can see this. You can make a graffiti temporarily. That's you incredible. Know? You can see this. And always present weapons, ready to be fired at the approaching Russians. That's a sight about this one. Visits to structures such as these give insights into Hitler's final days, but visits are not enough. The secrets that lie underneath the streets of Berlin need to be exhumed. We will use science to exhume the bunker from its burial place. Science that will ultimately allow us to walk the corridors of Hitler's lost bunker. Hitler's bunker. At one time, two interconnected structures, the Four Bunker and Hitler's Fuhrer Bunker. They were both buried on the grounds of the huge Reich Chancellery. Today, somewhere under this anonymous Berlin parking lot, remnants of the Fuhrer Bunker may still lie. The infamous inner sanctum where Adolf Hitler and his Third Reich came to a fiery end. Did any pieces of this bunker survive two different demolition attempts? Is it possible that Hitler's secret bunker still exists? In order to find out, Unsolved History brought specialist Dietmar Arnold and Dr. Alfred Kendall to survey the site. Geophysicist Gerd Plamen is already there with a magnetic sensor that can electronically remove tons of dirt and expose whatever might still remain. The bunker was built with concrete, reinforced with iron rods. Our sensor can trace iron underground. If the concrete is still there, then these rods can still be detected. To make sure the results of this survey can be fitted accurately into the city's maps and records, key reference points on the grid are marked, and these positions fixed by GPS registration. The assistant also takes notes of any surface objects which might form obstacles or could also be used as visual reference points. As we crisscross the field, measurements are taken. Ja, würden wir jetzt einfach mal weiter. Genau, da würde es einfach wieder gegen Null gehen. 
wäre etwa hier an der Stelle. Also hier wäre es dann auch so mit der Wiese. Incredibly, it seems that something is still there. Die ist 4 Meter stark, die Außenwand. 11 bis 15 Meter etwa auf dem Band. The data has been collected. Now begins the hard part, processing this information. But what did this complex look like when Hitler still walked its narrow corridors? To help us answer this question, we need to go back in time. Hidden in the vaults of the National Archives in Washington, D.C., we uncovered outtakes from history. In this case, footage taken in Berlin in July of 1945 by an American Army cameraman. Here were the windows to Hitler's reception hall overlooking the park-like grounds of the Reich Chancellery. The camera pans to the bunker's exhaust tower, which was often mistaken as a guard tower. Here is a close-up of the emergency exit used to remove Hitler's body before it was burned. Now, the camera pans over to the exhaust tower and the emergency release door. This wide shot shows the bomb damage to the chancellery roof. We also see another view of the bunker's emergency exit and exhaust tower. This extraordinary film shows us what the exterior of the bunker looked like. But Hitler never allowed photographs of its interior. Only a few post-war images survived. Here, the wreckage of Hitler's private bedroom and the sitting room next door, where he committed suicide. Eva Braun sat on this sofa when she poisoned herself. As we exit, we see the guard's watch room leading to the emergency exit where Hitler's body was carried before it was burned. After these pictures, the Soviets and their East German inheritors did their best to demolish all traces of the bunker. But in their attempts to keep Berlin divided during the Cold War, the East Germans actually helped us in our investigation. For after East Germany fell in 1989, their secret files became accessible to our researchers. One of these files contained images that transformed our investigation. Although the Russians blew up the bunker in 1947, their work was incomplete. And as it had been located in a no man's land, its ruins lay undisturbed for 25 years. But in 1972, in an attempt to block any escape route to the West, the Stasi, the East German secret police, sent teams down into Hitler's bunker. They were looking for potential escape tunnels that might lead under the Berlin Wall to West Germany. And they took photographs of what they found. As a sign of the paranoia of the times, the Stasi officers who took these photographs even blotted out their own faces. But their photographs allow us to get some idea of what the bunker's interior looked like. This is the machine room in the upper bunker. These could be the beds where Magda Goebbels poisoned her six children. The stairs going down to the deep bunker are rectangular. There is no spiral staircase as many historians have insisted. And this is the ruin of the deep bunker itself. The story of this bunker's construction begins in November of 1940, a time when Hitler's boast that his Third Reich would last a thousand years seemed an accurate prophecy. Hitler's conviction that he would prevail is always a difficult thing to say because his mind often operated on two different levels. 
And towards the end, a lot of German generals began to wonder whether Hitler had a a fundamental sort of subconscious desire to lose. I mean, some of his decisions were so crazy and so self-destructive uh, that his mind really did seem to be operating in a sort of contradictory fashion. Adolf Hitler's seat of power, the Reich Chancellery, was leveled after the war. But in 1940, by the deliberate design of Hitler's favorite architect, Albert Speer, it presented a formidable facade to any visitor. Here is where it stood. Here is the location of the Führer bunker in the Reich's Chancellery's garden. Attached was the upper or fore bunker built in the mid 1930s. Over here, the recently excavated driver's bunker. Although the chancellery loomed over the landscape, the high water table below made underground construction difficult. I was living there. I went down the corridor and saw how a huge pit was being dug by a mechanical digger. And they were pumping out water, masses of it. And I said, what's that going to be? Are we getting a swimming pool? No, no, they said, we're building a bunker here. Final construction of Hitler's lower bunker began in the summer of 1943 under conditions of utmost secrecy. But amazingly, unsolved history uncovered an Allied air reconnaissance photograph taken that same fall. In it, we can see this construction site for the Führer bunker here. This photograph holds some of the keys to the mystery of the bunker and raises a question that has haunted historians. Could the bunker and its occupant have been bombed from the air? Now, a team of photo analysts have gathered together to unlock the secrets contained in this photograph. In this nondescript office park outside Washington, D.C., there's a facility whose job it is to analyze potential military targets. The team we have assembled at Boeing Autometric have many years of photo analytical training behind them. We asked them to analyze this extraordinary aerial photograph taken by the British in 1943. What does this photograph tell us about the construction of Hitler's bunker? And what could it have told the Allies in 1943? We were asked to look at specific features of the Reich's Chancellery complex, which was the nerve center of Hitler's Germany. That's the formal entrance. But that's, the, that's no construction. This is Using today's most advanced digital technology, as well as the same techniques available in 1943, our team examined the photograph. They are camouflaging, covering something. Oh, absolutely. That's right, and that's the only camouflage netting that we've been able to identify. Other than natural. Yeah. Although the builders carefully concealed the bunker's construction, details began to emerge. To the left of these formal gardens, we have a very long, rectangular structure. Now, this is a formal gardening area again, but under stereo is more than what meets the eye. We have something here that is underground. So that whole area is an extensive effort to camouflage. As we move further down, we can see construction activity, and here we can see distinctive shadowing. It's definitely underground construction, and then the question is, how are they removing the material? If you look with care, you'll see there's a truck and the back end of the truck is into the structure. Definitely something going on there. Our analysts believe that the bunker's construction was carefully concealed, with the excavated dirt being moved from here over to here, where trucks, like this one, would drive it away. Could 
the British in 1943 have noticed this secretive construction and realized the reasons behind it? Could they have targeted and destroyed Hitler's bunker and Adolf Hitler? We asked Wolfgang Tom, one of Germany's leading experts in munitions. The strongest bomb that the British entwickelt had, had to be taken. That was the DP-22000. I would have used the heaviest bombs the British had. That would have been the DP-22000 pound bomb. That weighed 10.1 tons in metric weight. 22,000 pounds, 10 tons heavy. This was the biggest bomb there was. One of these could have penetrated the Führer bunker due to the pointed construction. Could Hitler's bunker have been penetrated by this 10-ton bomb? Could the British have surprised Hitler inside his lair? Rockus Misch was one of Hitler's phone operators and was plugged into the German defense system. Rechtzeitig Meldung bekommen von England, da hatten da auch unsere Leute gehabt. Die konnten schon mal voraussagen, dass ein Luftangriff auf Berlin stattfindet, oder nicht? Es ging doch alles über über Telefonie, über die Vermittlung. Incredibly, Misch still remembers Hitler's private phone number. If you were calling from outside, the Führer bunker's telephone number was 120050. Was there just one connection to the bunker or more? One line. Perhaps the only real chance of killing Hitler in his bunker would have been an assassin from his inner circle. It would not have been an impossibility. Waren Sie eigentlich bewaffnet? Wer? Da unten. Ich? Ja. Äh, ja was war eine 65er? Eine Walter oder was? Du weißt ja, ob es Walter eine 75er Ja, Walter. Ja. Walter Pistole, 65er. Die habe ich auf dem, neben dem Vermittlerscharm durchgezogen, geladen bei mir immer liegen gehabt. Und dann hätten Sie also als eine Art Selbstmordattentäter, ja. sozusagen, wenn Sie jetzt ja. irgendwo wie Ben Laden. On this Waffen SS belt buckle found in the driver's bunker are the words, Meine Ehre heißt Treue. My honor is loyalty. The men around Hitler were armed and dangerous, but apparently not a danger to Hitler. Were there other ways that Hitler could have been killed in his bunker? There were higher ranking members of the Nazi regime who had the opportunity and maybe intention to kill Adolf Hitler. People like Hitler's favorite architect, Albert Speer. In his memoirs and in his war crimes trial at Nuremberg, Speer claimed that in February of 1945, he conceived of a plan to introduce poison gas into the bunker. He then testified that one month later, when it came time to implement his plan, a huge concrete shaft had been built, preventing him from accessing the vents. This claim has aroused skepticism in those who were there. The bombardment was so heavy and so constant that even if he would have gone to all these intakes, he wouldn't have survived, and everybody would have no despair. And our research uncovered evidence that the concrete shaft was already there before Speer conceived his plan. I've always been very dubious about Speer's claim. I think that it was pretty impractical, even if it had been physically possible. And secondly, I think it was part of Speer's um, confused thinking at that particular time uh, on what his real relationship was with Adolf Hitler. Apparently, Speer lied about his plot to escape the judgment of a court and history. But other bunker mysteries remain, and soon they will be solved, as we walk again through the dark corridors of Hitler's bunker. At the original location of Hitler's bunker, we conducted a geomagnetic survey. It is now time to process that information in order to accurately recreate the bunker's dimensions. Although the Russians and their East German inheritors did their best to demolish all traces, there might be enough left
to register on our computers. Bit by bit, data stream by data stream, Hitler's bunker begins to emerge from the shadows of history. We start with a street model of Berlin in the late 1980s, when the Berlin Wall still stood. We load now a picture of the buildings which were there during the war. Then, we age our computer model back to the Second World War, adding the buildings that once stood on the spot. The blue lines show the buildings which were visible on the surface. Green lines line out the structures which were not visible on the subsurface. Now, our new data is introduced. The white areas show locations with no magnetic anomalies. The red areas are the places where iron deposits were more dramatic. As the ceiling was destroyed, the red shows the bunker's surviving walls. After transforming our data, let's zoom in now to our area of interest. Slowly, the bunker begins to emerge until... This is the final result. This is very close to the, to the map and to the position of the Führerbunker. For the first time, we now know exactly where the bunker lies. The roof is gone, but much is still intact, surviving two different demolition processes. Based on our survey and archival research, we now know that the bunker was divided like this, with wide corridors running through its chambers, surrounded by thick bomb-proof walls. And incredibly, these walls still remain. Hitler's thousand-year Reich may have lasted only 12 years, but his bunker has survived against the odds. But our investigation is not over. Through the East German Stasi photographs, we have details of the bunker's interior. Our 1945 U.S. Army footage showed us details of its exterior. Our magnetic survey has revealed the bunker's dimensions. Only one thing is missing, details of its actual construction. Where were you on this plan? As the original plans were destroyed in the war, they need to be duplicated after the fact. A difficult task under any circumstances. Dietmar, by compiling plans and getting an accurate depiction of this, that's going to be a challenge for us because so many plans were wrong. Now I make only a plan reconstruction. And I like to take away the mysticism of this area. Um, I will try to recreate the bunker in 3D based on mostly Dietmar Arnold's plans and all the experience from other people we can collect. Help came from an unexpected direction. In a traffic jam at the right time and place. Erhard Schreier is an artist and book illustrator. In 1988, one year before the Berlin Wall fell, Schreier was trying to deliver some of his artwork to the East German State Publishing House when his car was held up in traffic. The police had blocked the road because of blasting. What Schreier didn't know was that he had stumbled on the second attempt to destroy the bunker. After his meeting with the publishers, he returned to the site. Since there was no guard, he went to talk to the demolition workers there. Was Adolf Bunker, was soll denn das sein? Da sagt er, du stehst ja gerade drauf. <lacht> war diese ebene Fläche, ja? das war die Grundplatte, das heißt die Deckenplatte. Und äh, klickt es bei mir. Adolf Bunker. Fortunately for our investigation, Schreier was an amateur historian and recognized the significance of his discovery and the consequences to history once the bunker was destroyed for good. Taking his sketchbook along, he made some astonishingly detailed sketches that filled in some of the missing details of the bunker's design. 14 years later, Schreier shared these drawings in his insights with our investigative team. 
Here is the bunker ceiling, complete with steel girders. Stahlträger. Stahlträger. Wie dick, wie dick waren die denn? Wissen Sie das? Haben Sie die zufällig gemessen? Ja, die habe ich gemessen. Das waren, glaube ich, 18 cm Höhe. 18 cm. Also ich habe sie genau gemessen. Ich kann ja, jetzt nicht das wäre genau nochmal interessant. Oder, ja, es das muss... Das ist nämlich auf Befehl von Hitler so gemacht worden. Mhm. Aus seiner Schreier's Geschichte sketches were exacting. Ja. His measurements showed that the outer walls were superior to most bunkers. Ja. Four meters thick, not the mere 3.5 meter standard of the time. Hier ist der Vorbunker. Interestingly, in order to deflect the concussion from the bomb blast, the two corners of the bunker closest to the chancellery were cut at a 45-degree angle. This reconstruction, with the ceiling removed, shows how the rest of the lower bunker was configured. Armed with these last pieces of information, Dietmar Arnold and Nikolai Luko input the data into a digital model. This would allow us to reconstruct the bunker in three dimensions, allowing us to walk through the recreated complex at will. But first, there was one more important step to take. The door, the closest we have now, with this down to the hebel, it must be closed. We start here. Da so ein richtiger Hebel unten und oben. Mm -hmm. Hier ich, sieht man noch mal einen. Ja, ja. Once our three-dimensional model was built, Rockus Misch checked it against his own memories of walking the bunker's actual corridors in 1945. Ja. Die Treppe runter. Ja. Hier ist ein Wachposten. Ja. Das ist richtig. Ja, ja. Der Karl Weichelt ist es. He confirmed our accuracy. Now. For the first time since 1945, we can walk the corridors of Hitler's bunker. So what are we looking at here? This is our final animation of a walkthrough of Hitler's bunker. Although Hitler's bunker is gone, Boy, after a laborious scientific reconstruction, to do this. This we can still pay a virtual visit. Really now, this place is so stark, it, it's like a prison or a tomb. The main way into the bunker was underneath the reception hall of the Reich Chancellery. There were two entrances, one at the southeast corner, one at the northeast corner. First, you had to go through airlocks, and then pass a guard who sat by the entrance to the central corridor of the upper bunker. You would then find yourself in the canteen, where the SS guards, the secretaries, and even the Goebbels' children might have been sitting. <laughs> on the right was the machine room, on the left, the kitchens. Going on, past the Goebbels' family quarters and the kitchen staff quarters, you come to the staircase which led to Hitler's lower bunker. There was another SS guard here. If you got past him, you would be standing in the waiting room. The first room on the right was the machine room. If you went through the central door, you could either enter Hitler's small conference room or leave by the emergency exit. On the way to this exit was the Hundebunker, the dog bunker. If you went through, you would be standing under the tower in the garden, the main air outlet. Here were the stairs for the emergency exit, and it was here where the bodies of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun were carried up to the garden to be burned. Back through these doors and this waiting room, we walked to Hitler's private chambers. First, you had to walk through this workroom to get to his private study. Next came Hitler's bedroom. Through its doorway, we looked back towards the study. There, Hitler and Eva Braun committed suicide. It is almost as if he got what he deserved. The bunker today symbolizes really that final grotesque collapse of the Third Reich of the Nazi regime. And 
and the way that you know Hitler uh, and uh, Goebbels uh, and the, some of the others killed themselves uh, in this um, sort of squalid concrete hole under the ground uh, really sort of summed up the end of that particular regime. What does the future hold for this bunker? Some want to obliterate its last remains, removing all traces of the bunker and Hitler's legacy from the face of the earth. But others feel there is a more fitting memorial. Just a hundred yards away from the bunker's location, simple blocks will stand, commemorating the innocents who lost their lives because of one man's madness. I think it's very important that the site of the memorial to the murder Jews of Europe will be in the heart of the new and old capital of Germany. It's very important that it is at a site where the murder had been planned. This is very close to where Hitler worked and made those plans to murder the European Jewry really fits. What do we want to do with this place? A natural fear that neo-Nazi groups might want to turn it into a shrine uh, to Hitler. This leads one on to the question of what sort of monument should be allowed to remain. Um, would it be a good idea to preserve it and open it up perhaps in years to come when the threat of a neo-Nazi uh, shrine is over? Or should it be destroyed completely? As a historian, I, I don't believe in destroying things. I think that, in fact, it should be uh, maintained or preserved. But I think that the argument for restricting or preventing, perhaps, public access uh, has a lot of justification. The real Nazis, they know where the bunkers are. The real danger for re-mystification is when you take it away, then you leave room for fantasy and so on. We, uh, we, there is no need to fear uh, the ashes of Nazism. There is a dilemma in preserving Hitler's bunker. In one sense, people can interpret it as enshrinement, a memorial to the madmen of the 20th century. But to others, obliterating history is taking that history away and not leaving links to the past. Through our research, we've managed to recreate the place where Adolf Hitler's nightmare ended. We've answered many questions, but of course, one question science can never answer. Why did the Holocaust happen? It was this man who died in this bunker who had created the Nazi empire and it dwindled down to nothing. It's important to remember that, to remember who that person was. This was his end. And in that, it tells a great story about the evil of Nazi Germany. <laughs>